Okay, well, why don't we begin? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our science chat. And it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Brendan Harley, who's the Robert W. Schaefer Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, and also the leader of the Regenerative Biology and Tissue Engineering theme at the IGB. Brendan received his bachelor's degree from Harvard University, his master's and PhD from MIT. Um, he did a postdoc at Children's Hospital in Boston and then joined the faculty here at UIUC as part of the spectacularly successful IGB hiring initiative. He rose quickly through the ranks to full professor and uh, now has an endowed position as I mentioned. Uh, Brendan's primary focus is on biomaterials, uh, both to study regeneration and also to study and treat human disease. This includes uh, cancer, and he's also a program leader in the Cancer Center at Illinois. Brendan's received numerous awards, including an NSF Career Award, a Young Investigator Award from the Society for Biomaterials. He's a fellow of AAAS. He also received a fellow position from the Center for Advanced Studies here on campus, and most recently was named a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. So Brendan today is going to be speaking about adapting commercial systems to create multidimensional tissue models. And as we've been doing for these chats, uh, Brendan will speak for about 30-ish minutes, and then there'll be plenty of time for question and discussion, and you are welcome to write your questions in the chat box, and then I will read them. So, Brendan? Thank you very much, Gene. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's strange times to be doing this virtually, but I think it's been a, an exceptional opportunity. I'm going to share my screen now. So uh, I want to start by just saying how much I appreciate the chance to come and talk about some of the work that we're doing both in my lab and, and at the IGB. And while it doesn't explicitly relate to COVID, um, I think uh, there's a lot of ways in which some of the platforms that are being worked on in, in our theme and across campus are really highly valuable for that. And so what I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about is a how-to guide to start thinking about ways to build multi -tissue, multi dimensional tissue models. And so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what that means and some of their applications. And uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of commercial products. And I promise you, I have no conflicts of interest or stock or anything else in these companies. Um, these are not the only platforms you could use for this. But what I was hoping to get across today is um, enunciating a need to develop increasingly complex um, models of tissues to use in the context of diagnosis and developing new treatments and sort of giving people an idea what's out there and what they can potentially use and incorporate into their lab from a, from a research mission. I also want to acknowledge uh, one of the graduate students in my lab, Samantha Zamputo, who helped in the preparation of this has been really on the forefront of some of the adaptations of some of the material systems in my lab. So before I get much further along, um, I want to just start by saying a little bit about what tissue engineering is and what it isn't and, and, and sort of lay the groundwork. I realize this is a, a pretty broad audience and I feel like it's useful for us to talk about some of the, the some of the standard of care sort of context in the area of tissue engineering. And so the idea of tissue engineering has been around for a, a couple of decades now. And, and the idea behind it has largely been in the space of developing um, something to repair, replace, restore, or even regenerate tissues. And this has largely been with the idea of using the, the tissue engineering triad. And what that is, is combining some sort of material, a biomaterial, we'll talk about some examples over the coming slides, with uh, cells. These could be cells derived from a patient, they could be cell lines, they could be animal cells. Lots of different types of cells are used. And again, we'll talk about a couple examples over the course of today. And combining the material and cells with the biologic, a growth factor, a cytokine, uh, a small molecule. And the goal has been by mixing together um, elements of this triad, materials, cells, and biologics, you're creating a platform that could be implanted into the body to induce regeneration. And that had been the idea of tissue engineering for a long time, is using these as building blocks to assemble tissues or neo-tissues and using them to treat disease. 
Increasingly, these types of applications, however, have been starting to be adapted to using a much wider range of applications. And one of them is really developing platforms to simulate tissues outside of the body with, without the goal of ever going back into the body, but rather to simulate the, the tissue environment, to ask more precise mechanistic questions, and even push in the direction of precision or personalized medicine, where you, you start talking about running N of one trials where you could get cells from a patient and use that to um, define a better treatment protocol. And while these are all you know in the future in developing contexts, I, I think it's useful to talk a little about some of the applications. And so before we go any farther, I, I want to at least introduce what my lab does here within the Institute. And you know, my lab is a biomaterials development lab. Our, our expertise is developing three-dimensional tissue mimics that can be used to uh, simulate a, a wide range of tissue microenvironments. And we, we do these for applications that span the range of what we think of as tissue engineering. We have some applications that I'm not gonna talk about today that's developing implantable materials to regenerate uh, craniofacial bone or orthopedic insertions, more traditional tissue engineering. But increasingly, we've been interested in developing materials that enable not only tissue regeneration, but also as platforms to aid human health. And, and this has really gotten us into developing these models of tissues that could be used outside of the body. Examples include an artificial bone marrow for the culture of hematopoietic stem cells in the, in the context of treatments of leukemias and lymphomas. We've been developing platforms to simulate the tumor microenvironment, um, particularly in a, in a form of brain cancer, which I will talk about today. And we've also been adapting some of these platforms to simulate other tissues such as the endometrium, the lining of the uterus, and using that as a, as a platform to explore some questions related to preterm birth. And so within all of this, though, is, is a question of what is the tissue environment and what is so interesting or exciting about, about mimicking it. And so I want to start there as sort of a, a first application. So if you pull back um, and look inside of our body, what you're gonna find across the tissues and the organs of our body is a really complex organization of cells and materials. And so before we go into thinking about developing multidimensional tissue models of tissues, I think it's useful to at least lay the ground rules. When you look inside tissues in our body, what you're gonna see are cells. And so here's a, here's a great illustration from a review that's a, a decade old now, but um, from Kevin Healy's group out at UC Berkeley. And so you have cells that are within our tissues and they interact quite strongly with their extracellular environment. So this extracellular environment can be comprised of um, tissue, so extracellular matrix. So this is collagens and proteoglycans and other glycosaminoglycans. They form the 3D structure that the cells live within. Within this environment, the cells interact specifically with uh, the tissues through a process called, known sort of as integrin ligand interaction. So you might think about it as if you or I were to go to a rock climbing wall, instead of just climbing up a smooth surface, there's different handholds we reach out and hold onto. Those handholds can be different sizes and shapes and, and morphologies. And, and we use those to different degrees to interact with our environment. Very similarly, there's a, a wide range of ligands that are our target sites in the extracellular matrix that cells will interact with, and they have specific integrins that target those ligands. And so cells sense and respond to their environment in that way. They interact with the matrix. They interact with small molecules that diffuse through the matrix. They interact with other cells. So like you and I might shake hands, or maybe not right now in the, in the case of COVID, but you know, they have ways in which they interact directly with each other through what are known as cadherin interactions and the like. And so we have cells interact with this rich dynamic environment. They are also able to secrete enzymes to degrade the environment and synthesize new um, matrix proteins. And so this is a very dynamic process. And so one of the questions that comes up a lot is how do we start simulating these environments? And so, but I think it's important to at least start with a little bit of the vocabulary. We have integrins, we have ligands, we have the extracellular matrix, we have cells, and we'll talk about some of that over the coming slides. Now, a confounding factor to that model that was just on the previous slide is that if you actually look inside the tissues and the organs of, of our body, um, they're not a uniform sack of tissue. There's a, a wide range of different levels of heterogeneity that you get exposed to. Uh, many tissues in our body are comprised of spatial gradients, transitions between different tissues. We see this process of remodeling or changing of the matrix that occurs over time. This happens in disease progression. So for example, on the bottom here, osteoporosis um, leading to degradation of bone that can lead to fracture. Uh, we see temporal changes that happen in, in development and during disease progression as well. 
Not only that, it's not just one cell interacting with the matrix. There's many different cells, and oftentimes there are very different forms. You can have stem cells and mature cells, vascular cells, um, neural cells, and the like. And so the question is how this heterogeneous mix of cells or this cohort interact with each other. And lastly, most tissues in our body, whether or not they're spatially graded, are at least hierarchical or have multi-scale architectures associated with them, structure built into the tissues that are important for function. And so what my lab has really been interesting and exciting in since we got off the ground a decade ago was developing platforms to understand this complexity and developing ways by which we can mimic elements of this complexity in order to gain um, improved insight of disease progression, of treatment modalities, and indeed to try to induce regeneration of tissues. So really the question we're faced with, um, and I love this example that uh, one of my uh, postdocs in the past, Sarah Padron, had um, originally developed, and she's now a research assistant professor here on campus, was that if this is the tissue microenvironment that we're dealing with in the body, it's an incredible mix of, of cells and matrix that varies in space and time. You know, what we're really trying to do at, the, at this level of technology that we have is asking questions about, can we develop a surrealist representation of this tissue environment? Can we ask some questions about what degree of complexity is necessary or sufficient to engineer into systems to promote desired outcomes? And those outcomes could be inducing regenerative healing after injury. It could be to develop platforms to understand the nature by which a stem cell gains in information from its environment to make decisions about quiescence, its ability to remain um, static for long periods of time or to differentiate. And perhaps it might be to develop a platform to gain some actionable insight about disease progression, or therapeutic targeting. And that's really what the, the, the holy grail of tissue engineering these days is, is to develop ways to, to, to represent the complexity we see at the tissues and the organs of our body in a way that is actionable and we can get quantitative insight out of. And that requires a lot of really exciting tools. And that's why I'm actually really interested to bring forward this lecture today to sort of lay the ground rules about what's really interesting and exciting about um, the development of tissue engineering platforms um, in the current age, but also to sort of identify that there's increasingly tools out there to bring more people into this tent. There's platforms that make it increasingly easy for you to bring in the idea of multidimensional tissue models into your own research to, to gain um, some improved understanding of phenomenon. And that's not to say that I don't want to collaborate with many of you and find new ways to develop interactions, but I think it's useful to, to point out that there are some ways to, to design the path forward. So the question is, what tools are there out there to help us start making more complex tissues? And I'm not going to obviously in 30 minutes go through the full detail, but I want to talk about a couple. You know, there's increasing availability of different biomaterials that you can get access to as a, as a research lab. There's a number of commercially available sources of collagens and fibrins, which are um, extracellular matrix derived proteins or matrigel, which is an amalgamation of tissue uh, matrix that's um, generated in a tumor microenvironment um, that allow you to create a three dimensional matrix that will gel on its own. Increasingly, there are um, bio inks that can be used in 3D printers um, that are can be derived from natural proteins. And, and we in our, our lab have a, in, in the, at the IGB had a, a grant from the National Science Foundation to set up a, a bioprinting facility to help start thinking about ways to use some of these inks um, to, to create more complex tissues, or you can make your own. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the make your own concept today. Uh, again, cell lines, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about this. You can work with cell lines that are immortalized cell lines um, that have been derived from a patient cell from a long time ago. You can increasingly work with patient-derived biospecimens, cells from a patient. Um, and But really what I wanted to talk about today is ways by which you develop um, conditions to generate cell co cohorts where you wanna to mix together multiple cell types or have multiple cell types work in concert together. Oftentimes um, this requires coming up with some ways to do complex cell cultures. And lastly, devices. Are there ways by which you can leverage tools to create more complex tissue engineering cultures? Um, there's a lot of in-house fabrication we all used to do in terms of microfluidic platforms and devices. And my lab certainly has done a lot of those and we have amazing facilities on campus to enable that. 
but increasingly there's some tools out there that you can also leverage to make it a little bit more straightforward or, or make it so that you might be able to fit some multi-dimensional models into your standard workflow. And I'm going to talk about two of them today. Again, there's no commercial connection. I'm not getting paid for any of these or anything like that. Um, I'm not saying th anything other than my lab could figure out how to work with them. Um, uh, and I'm happy to, to answer questions about some of them in particular if things come up later. So again, the, the goal I want to talk about today is this idea of layering in complexity. If we want to engineer a synthetic tissue environment, these multidimensional tissue models to ask actionable questions, one of the questions that comes to, to the fore is how do we really design the right platform? You could start with thinking about taking your cell of interest and bathing in a bath of cytokines. That's typically the way a lot of us start a lot of these platforms is understanding growth factor response, kinetics, and the like. And as we start building in a tissue environment, and I'm going to talk in the next couple of slides about ways we've developed some platforms that are amenable to a wide range of tissues. But as you add in a biomaterial environment, you uh, provide the opportunity to engineer in ligands, to engineer specific integrin ligand interactions, so a cell can sense its environment. You can also use the material to immobilize biomolecules or cytokines of interest or change the diffusion rates. And lastly, as we start working in, in the range of cell cohorts, we have multiple cells together. You can ask a number of really exciting questions about cell-cell contact driving response, but also um, small molecule signaling that takes place between cells where you have paracrine signaling from one cell to another or autocrine feedback signals that uh, small molecules generated by a cell will drive their own response. So what we're interested in is developing platforms to start pulling apart these different types of responses. And so my lab has chosen to use a, a platform that we've we've used quite uh, broadly and i'm going to concentrate primarily on this platform um, for the rest of the lecture and that's a, a library of hydrogels that are generated using gelatin macromer and so gelatin is a denatured form of collagen which is the primary building block in our body um, and one of the really exciting aspects of using gelatin is it has two parts on the gelatin macromer. And so here's a schematic illustration of the gelatin macromer and these red and these blue little sections are meant to illustrate. Um, one of the things we really like about using gelatin is it retains an RGD um, binding site. So uh, a, a simulant of the fibronectin um, ligand. So we allow natural cell matrix interaction. So cells can sense and respond and attach to this matrix. It also has within it uh, a degradation site that's sensitive to matrix metalloproteinases, the enzymes that cells will produce. And so this makes it a tissue platform that we can generate a 3D network and that cells can interact with directly and remodel and change over time. And the way we generate it is we want to form a cross-linked network of, of these um, gelatin macromers. And so we functionalize amine groups on the backbone of the gelatin with these methacrylamide groups here meant to be illustrated in these sort of purple spheres. And by changing the number of functionalization sites along the backbone, we can make a network that's relatively open and soft to a network that's really dense and stiff. And here's what they might look like. This is a, an image of one of these hydrogels. It's optically translucent. Um, it swells to accept a lot of water. Um, but when you look at the microscale, this is actually looking at individual glioblastoma cells from a, a, a form of brain cancer. And we see that these cell cohorts interact closely with the matrix. And in fact, this is a zoom in image taken by one of my uh, postdocs, uh, Emily Chen, um, looking at uh, cell matrix contact between a single glioblastoma cell here and the surrounding matrix. And so the cells really like interacting with it. And so we work primarily with this type of backbone. One of the things we really like about this backbone is that it's relatively straightforward to fabricate, although you can purchase some of these backbones as well. They've been functionalized. We then go in and we take not only a gelatin macromer with these methacrylamide cross-linking groups, we can methacrylate um, other matrix proteins such as hyaluronic acid, which we use for a brain cancer application, or you can acrylate factors such as acrylating a growth factor. And if you mix these acrylated growth factors and methacrylated um, ligands in with this precursor suspension and you use a UV light, you can photo immobilize them to form a 3D network that has everything mixed together. And so you can start playing with ratios and, and come up with a platforms where you change the cross-linking rate or the amount of growth factor or the like to create an increasingly complex environment. And you can use some other chemistries. Uh, so we have a number of polymer chemists that work in our group. Um, so one example is using these hyperbranched polyglycerols that we originally got from Steve Zimmerman's group here at UIUC. Um, where we use methacrylate groups on the backbone to cross-link these polyglycerols into our biomaterial. And then we use the thiolene chemistries to come back and create patterns. And so you can pattern growth factors or other things into your material to create increasingly complex environments. 
All right, so two other examples that all use the same backbone. So this is a, a variation of our gelatin that now has a, a, a thial group on the backbone. And the reason we use this is this can be run through our bioplotter on the, in the regenerative medicine theme here on, in the IGB. And so this allows us to actually print out these um, inks. And instead of using light to crosslink it, you use a, an enzymatic reaction to crosslink the reaction. Here's what one of these 3D printed gels might look like. We've also have variations where we create malamide functionalized gelatin backbones. These are a really rapid crosslinking network, and this allows us to actually create micro droplets. So individual droplets, 50 to 100 microns in diameter, to encapsulate a single cell and look at single cell um, um, applications. But I want to talk about some devices, which is what I really wanted to promise to do today. And so we have this ability to now to create a wide range of materials. We want to now look at them in some standardized ways. And that's really one of the most important things we found is we try to go from one off tissue models to more standardized rigorous platforms to look at cell response is um, creating these multi cell multi dimensional cell culture platforms typically requires integration with a much wider um, infrastructure on our campus. And so two platforms we've used. Is a, is a microslide platform made by Abidi and a 3D cell culture chip made by a company called AIM Biotech. This microslide um, culture is actually a relatively straightforward three by five grid of small wells that can have a hydrogel gelled within them. And we use these a lot to look at epithelial layers, which I'll talk about later. The advantage is that they have a, a glass bottom, you can image through them in, and use a small amount of material in a well-defined format. And so this allows you to integrate it with micropipetters, allows you to integrate it with imaging and the like. The other platform we use quite a bit if you, if you need to not just look at static culture, but dynamic culture, are these biotech chips. And what they are is a three-channel microfluidic device. So this is sort of a, a zoom in over here. It has a central channel where you can pipette in your hydrogel. It has a, so a hydrogel network. These bumpers actually prevent the hydrogel from moving out into the surrounding media channel layers, but it allows you to now flow media down two opposing channels on either side of the hydrogel. So this media can allow you to feed the cells. It can allow you to introduce cells. It also provides a, a biophysical element by having actual shear flow that's occurring within the media and diffusive transport between two different media channels. So you can actually put a growth factor in one channel and no growth factor in the other and create a gradient of factor across it. So these are really useful if you want to do static high throughput culture on the left or dynamic culture where you want to look at transitions on the right. So what I'm going to do is just talk about a couple examples of how we use them and, and the, the types of investigations they enable. And I, I think that's really an exciting starting off point to think about where we might go with this. And so again, the, the real advantage of starting to think about some of these platforms and not these specific ones necessarily, but these types of tools in general is that they typically involve small amounts of volume or area. So this allows you to start thinking about parallelization, running multiple experiments together, um, reducing cell numbers as you go from cell lines to patient-derived cells. You realize uh, cells you get from a patient are an incredibly valuable resource and you want to come up with ways to use them, even if there's only a small number of cells you can gather. Both of these devices are amenable to a wide range of materials, not just the gelatin systems we've used, but a much broader range. Um, they're all compatible with microscopy techniques. So you can do two photon or confocal imaging into them, and they facilitate a range of quantifiable assays. And I'll show you some of the ways in which we've done that. So the first um, real uh, scientific question that got us thinking about these more complex three-dimensional models of tissues was a, a project we've been working on for the last five or six years in concert with Mayo Clinic and now the Cancer Center at Illinois and here um, our own collaborations within the IGB and that's an glioblastoma, which is the more common, most common and lethal form of brain cancer. And so it, it has a median survival, unfortunately, of only about 15 months. Um, this has changed um, in the last couple of decades from 12 months to 15 months, but the overall survival rates remain um, depressingly low. Um, and this really, the survival rates haven't changed substantially in the last century. And so there's a lot of, a lot of challenges to addressing glioblastoma, but I'll set it up sort of briefly to sort of motivate why we use these multidimensional tissue models. Unlike a lot of cancers that um, the primary means of mortality is metastasis of the, the cancer from the primary tissue to a secondary tissue, uh, glioblastoma um, kills you by invading diffusely into the surrounding brain. And so unlike a lot of tissues where you can remove the tumor a wide margin or even remove the entire affected organ um, like breast cancer, um, obviously in brain cancer, um, you can't remove the entire brain. And so uh, uh, our neuro-oncology collaborators are forced to treat this 
through um, surgical resection or debulking, where they try to remove as much tissue as possible, all by radiotherapy. The challenge is because these tumors are invading diffusely, you're trying to put a sharp surgical margin across the diffuse cellular margin. So it's not surprising that there are cells that escape treatment. Um, and typically these, these patients recur about seven months after surgical resection and almost always in close proximity to the resection cavity. So we could spend a lot of time talking about some of the challenges of studying um, a glioblastoma is understanding the cellular makeup of the tumor. And that's in fact true. There's a lot of efforts to understand the mix of glioblastoma um, cells, glioblastoma stem cells, um, vasculature networks that are inside the primary tumor, as well as a, a range of primary neuro and um, immunological response cells that might be associated with the tumor as well. But the reality is, is that immediately after diagnosis, this entire tumor is removed. And so what we got really interested in as uh, uh, within our research theme was developing platforms to understand the transitions that cells would be experiencing. Those cells that are left after surgical resection and the ones that we're not treating appropriately to date. And so we got interested in developing platforms to mimic two microenvironments. I'm gonna primarily focus on one today, um, but one area is the perivascular niche, the vascular structures that extend from the tumor into the surrounding brain. There's been a lot of literature showing glioblastoma stem cells migrate along these perivascular structures. They proliferate rapidly, causing the, the, the breakdown of the vessel and the formation of local zones of hypoxia called pseudopalisades. The surviving cells then hop to a new vessel and repeat. And so during this process, these these cancer cells are exposed to a diversity of matrix proteins, they're, they're exposed to a diversity of cells, and they're, ex they're exposed to a diversity of metabolic environments, high and low levels of oxygen. And so recreating these in a, a tissue dish is very difficult. However, we have started to use these tissue engineering platforms to start mimicking some of those environments. And that's what I wanna show you some examples from. We have an emerging area of, uh, of work within the theme as well that's also really interested in um, developing uh, better models of the full neurovascular unit to also include um, immunological responses, particularly the formation of cultures between um, glioblastoma cells and microglia, which is one of the primary immune response cells in the brain, and understanding crosstalk between them. And again, these are challenging cultures to do in 2D culture or to study in an animal, but there's ways in which we can develop increasingly complex three-dimensional models to, to answer some mechanistic questions about how microglia activation is associated with cancer. All right, so really the goal of a lot of this work has been developing an integrated platform to study the role of extracellular matrix cues, cell-cell interactions, and metabolic constraint on glioblastoma cell activity. And we've published a lot on it, um, asking questions about how the matrix environment affects cell proliferation using a cell line. We've asked questions about cell matrix interactions and invasion in the context of hypoxia. We've increasingly started to look at ways to use patient-derived cells that have a a diversity of cell types within the specimen that we get from the tumors um, from our collaborators up at Mayo Clinic and asking questions about how the matrix environment might influence the progression of different cell types, such as the expansion of a stem cell fraction and how the presence of um, other cell populations within the environment influences things such as drug development. I think we're all really comfortable with the idea that uh, the matrix environment surrounding a cell might influence something such as invasion or proliferation. But we're increasingly um, worried as a field about how the matrix environment will also influence things such as drug response and ways that we can put together enough information to, to get a better understanding of how do we target cells in the tissue of interest. So that's where I want to turn to using some of these multidimensional models and ways you can use these platforms to ask some really exciting questions. So one of the questions we, we really use these um, commercially available chips quite a bit for is creating platforms to recreate the perivascular niche. So this vascular structure at the margin of the tumor where we see glioblastoma cells invading. And so there's a, there's a wealth of literature that you can use to, to take uh, endothelial cells and stromal cells, such as uh, starting with cell lines, a uh, human umbilical vein and endothelial cell and a lung fibroblast and you mix them together and they will spontaneously form three-dimensional vascular networks inside your biomaterial of interest. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a great resource out there in terms of some pioneering work by Steve George and Roger Cam um, to really set the stage for ways to do this type of work. And what we were interested in to try to adapt some of these cultures and use some of these multidimensional tissue models to gain actionable insight. 
So one area is to look at creating a three-dimensional vascular network. And so this is some work of mine, Yo, who's in my group. Um, she developed these platforms where we have now glioblastoma cells in green cultured with the vascular structures in large three-dimensional tissue models. And what she found is that she saw quite a bit of association between glioblastoma cells and the vasculature. And to really start picking apart this observation, we then turn to these multidimensional tissue models. So one example is using this AIM biotech chip. Again, you have a central gel channel and two media channels on either side. And so while you could grow a vascular network inside these channels, which I'll talk a little bit about more, what you could do instead is actually take conditioned media from these vascular networks and identify as individual factors that are associated with the, the conditioned media. So saying, okay, what small molecules are being produced by the vasculature? And can we use these tissue models to gain a better understanding of how the, the vascular environment influences things such as glioblastoma invasion. So we identify a bunch of individual factors that were associated with um, the secretome of the vascular structure. And then we can really use the power of these microvascular chips. So now we can take our biomaterial with our glioblastoma cells seated in one channel. And then in the opposing media channel, we add in the conditioned media. So instead of looking at direct cell cell contact, we're asking, does the presence of small molecules generated by the vascular structure influence how cancer cells behave? And using imaging methods, we can look in the media channel to, for example, image proliferating cells that would stain pink. So we see most of the cells that remain static in the media channel are proliferating. Whereas if you look in the matrix hydrogel channel, you see a number of cells here all stained in blue for their nuclei. Not very many of them are stained positive for proliferation. So we're able to look at, for example, how the process of invasion influences whether cells are proliferating or not. But more interestingly, we can actually look at how does the conditioned media affect this process. And what we can show is that with these chips is that by taking conditioned media in one channel and seeding cells on the other, we can measure how rapidly or how far they invade through the hydrogel. And we see that they invade farther and faster in response to the conditioned media. And in fact, we can take individual factors we identified from the conditioned media and see those individually into the opposing channel and look which ones actually drive the response. So in this case, we can pin it down to a single factor we've associated with increased glioblastoma invasion in the context of a vascular network. You can then use some of the imaging tools. And so these are just some pretty pictures, but showing individual glioblastoma cells, again, stained in green, invading through the three-dimensional network. And you see their close interaction with vascular structures. And so there's ways in which you can do a lot of really fascinating time-lapse images to watch migration and activity of cells within these channels. One other thing I just wanted to point out is, is the complexity of doing these cultures. What, what I showed you is using these chips as a way to sort of pick apart the complexity by instead of putting all the cells together at first, to simply put cells in contact with media conditioned by the other cell source. One of the other things that we noticed, however, is that when we grow our vascular networks, they become very stable after about a week, and they remain stable in our hydrogels for multiple weeks in culture. However, the moment we see glioblastoma cells in with the vascular um, structures, the vascular structures still form, but then start falling apart. So they actually show a phenotype very similar to this process of um, co-option and regression you see in the native brain. And so it suggested to us that not only was the vasculature creating signals to signal to the cancer cells, but that the cancer cells might be creating signals to stimulate the vascular network. And so this led us to another major question, which is how do we um, uh, better pick apart uh, the way multiple cell types behave together? And so this I want to uh, provide a, a, just a, one of the amazing values on our campus is the bioinformatics and sequencing course we have from the work across the street that Alvaro Hernandez runs at the sequencing center to the high performance computing and biology group here within the IGB to really provide insight about how do we actually study complex cell cohorts. And so we work collaboratively with them to develop a platform to use RNA-seq, so looking at the transcriptome of the entire culture to pick apart what's happening in multi-cell cultures. And so in order to do this, we would compare hydrogel where we had our our glioblastoma cells with our vascular structures and what we call triculture versus the same experiment where we put them, um, the, the glioblastoma cells in one hydrogel and the perivascular cultures in a different hydrogel that were never mixed together and we isolated the RNA from them. And so we mixed the RNA together in the same ratios as the triculture. And what this allowed us to do is look at the thousands of genes that were up and down specifically due to the interaction between these cell populations. And the reason why I point this out is that this actually led us to identify the most highly upregulated gene in all of this 
um, uh, RNA-seq analyses associated with the triculture was a gene um, called MGMT, which is linked to the, the resistance to the frontline drug used to treat glioblastoma. So what it suggested actually was that the presence of the vascular networks um, would lead to these glioblastoma cells being less re um, responsive to the frontline therapy that we're using in the clinic right now. So in fact, we can go back and do that experiment. And so this is a kind of an exciting culture down here on the bottom right, where we're looking at a GR50 metric, which is a growth rate inhibition. So the idea is we put more and more drug, this temozolomide, the frontline drug used to treat glioblastoma. As we add um, more and more drug onto the, the culture, we'd see a reduction in the GR50 value of our GBM cells only. However, when we do their co-culture with a vasculature, we see that reduction is completely lost. And so we were able to just highlight that using these commercially available platforms and really leveraging some of the advances in the last few years in sequencing on our campus has really led us to a really exciting observation that the direct connection between vasculature and glioblastoma might be a, something we should be able to target in a better way. And that's part of some ongoing collaborations moving forward. One other area I wanted to point out just really briefly as we move on is that there's a whole other frontier in tissue engineering in the context of brain disease. And so work with some other collaborators um, uh, such as Lisa Stubbs here at, within the IGB has led us to start thinking about using these platforms to study a number of degenerative diseases. And so really what this is allowing us to think about is ways to create patient specific neurovascular units. So the neurovascular unit is a structure inside the brain where you not only have a vascular structure, but also the presence of astrocytes and neurons. And so we've been really looking to adapt our platforms now to, to grow all these cells together, where we can either start with primary cells derived from the neurovascular unit, microvascular endothelial cells and pericytes, astrocytes, which we can now combine in our hydrogel cultures. And here you're seeing vasculature in green and individual astrocytes creating cultures here in red where they're connecting with their vasculature. We're able to show that this will form a, a mature vessel network where we're stating for things such as tight junctions and the formations of basement membranes inside these networks. But more excitingly, recently with some work with Yi Lu here on, in the Department of Chemistry, we developed with some adaptations to our hydrogel systems, again, using our, our gelatin backbone, but modifying with a ferulic acid um, crosslinker that when you crosslink it using a lacase actually forms a hypoxic environment. So it consumes oxygen. And hypoxia is thought to be a primary driver of a number of neurodegenerative diseases. And so what it's allowed us to do is actually take neural stem cells, culture them in these microfluidic chips, um, in a hydrogel that during this cross-linking to form actually forms a local hypoxic zone. We can create different amounts of hypoxia within these hydrogels and shown that they substantially influence neural stem cell differentiation. But instead of taking different cell types and mixing them together, what we're starting with is a neural stem cell population and then differentiating multiple cell types within the same culture environment. And so what you can see here is astrocytes and neurons we can start seeing differentiation markers of inside of our hydrogels. But more excitingly, some beautiful pictures of actually co-cultures of neurons and astrocytes where we're forming interpenetrating networks of these cell types, um, starting from a uh, neural stem cell population and using the microenvironment and the presence of a hypoxic region to help facilitate their culture. So in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to focus on the, the other sort of use we've used for a lot of these cultures. I talked a lot about this AIM biotech chip to create a single channel flanked by media channels to look at dynamic supplementation and process of gradients. I wanna talk a little bit about one application we're using of this Abidi platform. Um, in the context of maternal mortality. And so there's, um, there's a lot of questions about uh, maternal mortality um, writ large across the country, across the world. One thing that we note is that um, maternal mortality in the US is higher than a lot of other developed nations. And there's a lot of reasons why this is, that, that this is thought to be the case. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the, the details of all that right now, but one of the areas we were really excited about is developing plat platforms of the endometrium. So the lining of the uterus, so if you look here, we see, um, lining of the uterus, it's a stratified tissue, um, and we were interested in developing platforms to look at preeclampsia, which is a hypertensive disorder associated with um, uh, reduced maternal and fetal health. And so really we wanted to create a platform to mimic this decidualized endometrium to make some studies about trophoblast invasion um, to test some hypotheses that are out in the literature. And, and really the goal was to how do you develop a, a stratified culture? And so if you look at the, the, the lining of the uterus here in this, uh, endometrium, you have a luminal epithelium and then an underlying um, stromal layer that has a decidualized stroma and vascular network. 
And so while I've showed you a lot about how we start to create these co-cultures of vascular networks inside of a biomaterial, I haven't talked a lot about how do you create a, an intact luminal epithelium, so a, a, a lining of a, of, of a tissue. And so I want to talk a little bit about ways you can use these multidimensional models to, to do that. And so while we're doing lots of other work in this area, and this is the work run by Samantha Zambuto and my group, um, we've really been interested in creating a model of the endometrial epithelium. So that's really been an advantage of creating these, um, these platforms. We can create small volume hydrogels and then have a seeding channel on top to then add in epithelial cells, allow them to culture for a period of time. And what we can show is we can create our gelatin hydrogel with an epithelial layer on top, and we can start staining for the formation of a mature epithelium, looking at, for example, cytoskeletal markers that are associated with the formation of a basement membrane. Now, so this really allows us to parallelize our study, looking at a wide range of different cultures. And in fact, I want to put one other technology out there, and this is another technology from uh, a lab within uh, the regenerative biology and tissue engineering theme at the IGB, and that's the work of Greg Underhill, who's been developing these high throughput microwave platforms, where you're functionalizing an elastic surface with extracellular matrix proteins and combinations, and it allows you to rapidly screen a whole wide range of um, matrix interactions. And so what we've been interested in is using um, this platform where we can actually dot a whole bunch of different extracellular matrix proteins and look at their combinations and the number of um, uh, endometrial epithelial cells that form um, coherent structures on, on their surface. And so what we've been able to identify is a number of extracellular matrix proteins that really um, are associated with uh, um, uh, a large number of epithelial cells forming together into more stratified sheets. So this is still in its infancy, but using these types of microfluidic chips and 3D patterning tools give us some tools to really assess them more rapidly. So I realized that was a lot, but what I hope you get out of it was that we're, we're as a field starting to think about uh, amenable ways to create increasingly levels of complexity in our cultures where we have materials, cells and biologics mixed together, and we would love to be able to um, use that as a resource that campus could use to think more deeply about ways they create their own multidimensional models with applications in regeneration and complexity and cancer. So that I want to thank the people that do the work and pay the bills and our, our wonderful collaborators and certainly leave some room to take questions if you have any. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much for that great talk, Brendan. We do have uh, some questions. So here's the first one. What is the depth of your 3D cultures? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so it depends. So if you're if you're trying to form uh, three-dimensional cultures on their own, uh, typically people start forming them in the range of a millimeter or two um, in thickness. Um, however, the, the advantage of a lot of these microfluidic chips is you can get down to the range of three to 400 microns in, in, in um, width. Uh, in depth. Uh, and the reason for that is twofold. One, a lot of imaging tools are, uh, are, it's tough to image further than a few hundred microns into a material. So using these microfluidic patterning tools, we can create um, uh, hydrogels that have a thickness that's amenable to image all the way through. And the other is that most of these um, 3D cultures that don't have a vasculature within them, don't have a way to provide a biotransport of oxygen and nutrients. And so when you go to really thick hydrogels, a millimeter or two in thickness, you actually end up with a hypoxic core. And so again, a lot of these devices allow you to standardize creating um, hydrogels that are thin enough that you get rapid biotransport through the, through the material. Okay, uh, the next question is, what's the difference between um, multidimensional cult cell cultures and organoids? That's a great question. Um, and this is an area that I, I'm really excited to see some development over the next few years. So the traditional way of forming an organoid is you take a stem cell source and you typically mix it with a bath of morphogens or cytokines and you allow those cells to form a spheroid. And then that spheroid will actually go through some level of developmental type processes to form a pattern structure. So the goal is you're starting with a cell source and you're then gaining um, some sort of um, morphology that comes out of that, um, that that emerges from the cells through the remodeling type process that occur. Whereas the, the types of uh, tissue on a chip platforms are typically where you have cells mixed in a biomaterial, um, where the biomaterial provides some structure or signal. And so we've done cultures where we have cells distributed, for example, these vascular structures 
we start a sales distributed as a um, uh, just a, a, a distributed mix of, of individual cells that then will form into a network um, in a coherent fashion. We've also done cultures where we start with a spheroid of cells and embed them in the gel and look at processes such as invasion and the like. And so, um, but so those are those are traditionally thought of as two very separate technologies. However, there's increasingly a lot of interest in thinking about ways to create organoid on a chip platforms where you actually use some of the context of emergent behavior, um, but also where you allow the use of a material or a microfluidic platform to provide external stimuli to create um, more pattern responses. And so I think um, some of the work that uh, is starting to occur within the IGB and, and writ large across the field is thinking about are there ways we can actually bring together these two technologies in a more coherent fashion. Um, currently, they're sort of the subject of a lot of um, think pieces and review articles, um, not with any sort of cited work, but sort of thinking about where we're going in the future. But I think there's a lot of really exciting opportunities to leverage the ability to, to use emergent behaviors that cells can drive within microphysiological environments that we can engineer. We have some sort of control over spatial and temporal signals that we provide to those cells to, to, to add to the level of complexity that you can build out. Okay, next question. Uh, I'll read it verbatim. Great talk. Your research is amazing. What is your opinion about decellularized tissues for tissue engineering? And how do you deal with the lack of oxygenation in the middle of 3D systems? So decellularized tissues, I think, are, um, are, are, are a great opportunity. Um, so there's two ways that decellularized tissues have been used. Some tissues uh, that have, have made it all the way clinical translation is you take a, so for example, porcine um, submucosa is a, a membrane type material used surgically for a wide range of repair applications that is actually a decellularized tissue where they just take the porcine um, intestinal submucosa, they decellularize it, you get a sheet that's sort of like a, a porous sheet of material that can be then implanted and is used surgically for a wide range of membrane and barrier applications. Um, you also can take decellularized tissue and chop it up and turn it into a different structure. And so a lot of the work that we do for um, uh, that I didn't talk about today in regenerative medicine is we take collagen that's been isolated from bovine tendon that's been decellularized. We take that matrix, we chop it up, we then turn it into a, a, a sponge-like material. Um, and that sponge-like material is a, a three-dimensional foam that we then implant to use as a, a, a a regenerative strategy. And so I think using that is really advantageous in some ways because it has all the native things we like. It has handholds, these integrins, the, the ligands for inter and ligand interaction. It has the ability to be remodeled and it has a lot of the native chemistry and complexity associated with tissues. Um, you know, the, the other half of the question that they asked was about oxygen transport. And this is the this is the big, this is the dirty secret of a lot of tissue engineering is that, you know, if you look inside our body, you know, we have capillary networks that are separated by only a couple of hundred microns because that's about the diffusion path length you can get of oxygen and nutrients required to sustain metabol metabolically active tissues. And so until you grow back those vascular structures, it's really hard to think about regenerating large tissue constructs. And so traditionally our field deals with it in two ways. One, a lot of the early work was in things such as cartilage where cartilage is, is really nice because it's a metabolically, uh, a low metabolic activity tissue and it has no native vasculature. And so we didn't have to think about regenerating it. The other way that we, we deal with it is we make compromises in terms of designs. And so one of the big ones is creating porous biomaterials. Typically biomaterials have to be at least 80 to 90% porous. Um, so think about like a kitchen sponge that you have. Um, and the reason for that is you need that porosity to allow rapid diffusion of nutrients. If you implanted a material as dense as the native tissue you were trying to replace without any vasculature, you very rapidly would have a hypoxic um, zone in the middle of your material that would lead to massive amounts of cell death. And so we get around that by creating really porous materials. The challenge is then really porous materials are also really soft. And so then you have a separate problem that, well, do you make your material denser to make it stronger? Or, and sacrifice oxygen transport? Or do you um, come up with a way to get around the mechanics while maintaining a tissue really porous? And so we've actually, some other work in our group um, has really been pioneering the use of multi-scale composites. So think like rebar in concrete, 
Concrete is really strong in compression, really bad in tension and, and torsion. Um, rebar is really good in tension and torsion and really bad in, in compression. And so you create a composite that has structural and functional advantages. And so we've started to 3D print um, polymeric reinforcement frames that we can embed into our materials, make the material porous and so cell bioactivity is high, but use these frames as a mechanical reinforcement. And so there's no great one size fits all solution. There are different design um, choices you make and different consequences you have to live with, unfortunately. But I, there's a lot of us in the field really thinking about ways to get around them, induce more rapid vascular ingrowth, allow um, angiogenesis to take more to take place more rapidly. These are all really major questions that these types of systems allow you to explore um, efficiently. Okay, I'll ask a question. Um, you drew a contrast uh, when you were talking about glioblastoma between um, diffusion and uh, more traditional metastasis. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is that because the glioblastoma cells are different than other cancer cells, or is it because the brain is so different than all other tissues? It's a great question. Um, it's, it's one of those that there's probably a number of reasons behind it. And unfortunately, one of the reasons why glioblastoma probably doesn't show a lot of signs of metastasis is because it kills the patient so rapidly you don't have time to see it progress. Um, there are a lot of really interesting questions though about what about the, the environment inside the brain might limit metastatic spreading because you have, for example, breast cancer, one of the primary means of mortality is metastasis to the brain. So there's plenty of cancers that metastasize relatively efficiently to the brain. And there's a lot of really exciting questions about how do you look at um, metastatic processes. So in fact, one of the original uses of these AIM biotech chips, they've been developed in Roger Cam's lab at MIT, um, was to create vascular networks to look at, um, to put cancer cells inside the network and look at how they, they move through the ves vessel structure into the surrounding biomaterial in these channels. Um, and so there's a lot of questions about it, but what we do know is glioblastoma cells, they associate very closely with vasculature to the point they actually are popping astrocytes off the vessels as they migrate along them, but they tend not to penetrate into the vessels and, uh, and move around. And there's not a great um, reason yet. I think a lot of it is that it's such a, a, a rapid and efficient killer, you just don't see signs. There may be metastatic spread, but you don't see it coming up. So we may solve the primary tumor problem and then have a whole other problem that emerges afterwards. But it's, it's, it seems to be a, a unique aspect of some of these um, astrocytomas that they tend to remain within the brain. They might spread down the central nervous, central nervous system into the spinal column occasionally, but that's about as far as you typically see them spreading. I guess that suggests that uh, glioblastoma cells might be more evolutionarily derived than other forms of cancer cells. Oh, that's a great question. Um, that's a really good question. I will leave it as a really good question and not uh, muddle my own engineering thoughts on top of that. <laughs> but I, I think it, I think it's a it's a there's a lot of there's a lot of um, differences in how a lot of these neurological cancers progress, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to develop platforms to ask these types of questions. You know, that's, I think that's one of the most exciting parts about developing these multidimensional models is that a lot of these questions are incredibly difficult to monitor in vivo. And we realize we're not creating a fully functional brain, but that these types of co-cultures and platforms allow you to address certain types of um, hypotheses or look at certain types of mechanisms to gain some insight that maybe would help us understand some of this progression. Well, plenty still to do, huh? A lot still to do. All right. Well, seeing no more questions on behalf of uh, the audience, I'd like to thank you very much for a great talk. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And I hope you stay uh, safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you. And stay safe, everyone.